Welcome to The Writer's Dream. This is a show where authors can talk about how they write their books, how they publish them, and how they market them. You can find us on Facebook. We have a uh, page called The Writer's Dream, believe it or not. And uh, if, you ha if you want to be on the show or you want to ask me a question, please, by all means, message me through that uh, Facebook page. We're also on YouTube, and we're also on the uh, website for ltveh.org. Just search for The Writer's Dream, and you can see all of our videos there as well. Today's guest is Barbara Ann Mojica, and she is a retired educator and a historian, and she is the author of a most interesting and fun book series called Little Miss History. Welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. Barbara's here for her second time because she keeps visiting places and writing new books. <laughs> never stop traveling and never stop writing. <laughs> that, that's, that's a good thing. So, Briefly describe the series. Okay, the series is a nonfiction picture book, book series for uh, children in elementary and middle grades primarily, but adults love to read them as well. I love them. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, it involves uh, traveling to various historical places uh, and meeting historical people in sometimes unusual settings. Um, Little Miss History is a character uh, that was designed by my illustrator husband. Uh, when I decided Victor. I Victor, yes. Uh, he, when I decided I wanted to write books for children, uh, he said, "Well, why don't we use a cartoon-like character? Because one of the things my husband does draw is cartoon characters." <laughs> and I thought that that was a great idea. Uh, I wanted to, my whole objective is to make learning about history fun. Uh, and I know when I first sat in an elementary school classroom, learning about history was not fun. No. We, <laughs> we sat and we read paragraphs, and then we might talk for a couple of minutes about the paragraph, but that was it. Uh, so I wanted to make it a fun experience, and Little Miss History's model is uh, if you don't know your history, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's hmm, true. Hmm, timely. <laughs> and, no, because I tell, when I visit uh, children uh, in schools and I see them at book signings and book festivals, I tell them everybody has a, has a history and I show them that the word history has the word story right in it. Uh, way back before we didn't even write, oral tradition was really telling history and passing it down from one generation to the other. So I tell them you have a history and it, it, it doesn't have to be a big monumental important thing. Uh, you learn from your experience. So if you fall off your bicycle one day and you get up and you keep practicing and do it over and over again. <laughs> Eventually you learn it and it becomes part of your history. The same thing if, if you touch a hot stove and you burn your hand, you remember that. That becomes a part of your history and your learning experience. So we're both teachers and we both probably learned uh, our history pretty much the same way as you described it from books, reading the book, looking at a picture if we were lucky. And I get excited when I go to a school and I see how they're learning today. Much different. It's much different. But also, when we went to school, and you talked about um, uh, folklore and oral history, there were no distractions. That's, that's what you had. You know, you, you, people who learn from oral history, they had a storyteller. The storyteller told the tale. Right. Then we had teachers. It was the only thing that was there, really, until television. And then television became a distraction. And now everything is a distraction. So if you want to teach history, you really have to be very creative. So I think that this is extremely creative because you're going to different places and you're bringing that into the school. So where'd you get the idea to do it this way? Well, I love to travel. I, I'm a lot like Little Miss History. Uh, I used to hike. I used to camp. Uh, I, I traveled all over. I was very fortunate. Um, it's almost as soon as I started working, I started traveling. So I've visited more than half the United States, and I've been to more than 30 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. um, when um, 
the communist world first became open to the West for travel, I was on one of the first tours. <laughs> so I took a tour to Russia, uh, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and that was quite an experience. I bet. Uh, we were segregated in tourist hotels, mm -hmm. but and you pretty much saw what the government wanted you to see. Oh, absolutely. But um, it was interesting. I even got to cross the Checkpoint Charlie and the Berlin Wall and <laughs> all these things that, that don't exist today. But um, I just love to travel and I know kids love to be transported to different places. So I come up with an idea of a place that I find interesting and that probably people don't know everything about. And it, it once you're at that place or that site, there's an opportunity to learn a lot of new things. Besides it, an actual history, I really don't tell the actual history of a place, but I go off in different directions with the people, the places, and often little known characters uh, that people don't know with part yeah, of the for, story. For instance, one of the books you have is on Ellis Island. Yes. And I noticed that in the book, Little Miss History changes into a Little Miss immigrant. immigrant. And so where did you get the idea to do that? Is the immigrant based on a person you saw at Ellis Island? Uh, it's kind of a, a compilation of the pictures that we saw of the immigrants mm -hmm. at, at Ellis Island. And uh, my illustrator, my husband, kind of designed the costume. It's not <coughs> a costume per se, but a conglomeration of right, different pieces. Right, yes. She looks like an immigrant saw. from the 18, late 1800s. Yeah. And then when she gets inside, she takes it off and gets into her traditional costume again. Yeah, no, that's, that, but that, when you go to a museum or a national park, one of the most compelling things, I think, from my point of view, is the photographs of the people who lived at the time that they're, the history that they're trying to depict, and you look at them and you wonder what's going through their mind. And, um, right. So I, I think that you've been able to capture that. How many of these have you done? Well, right now there are seven books in the Little Miss History Travels 2 series. I bet um, I have them all. There are uh, Mount Rushmore, uh, Statue of Liberty. Uh, Let's see if you remember the Sequoia them. National <laughs> Park. <laughs> Ford's Theater, which is a, a history of the theater itself more than the event of the assassination mm, mm. of President Lincoln. Uh, Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum, because that has an amazing history from yeah. way back to World War II, uh, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, uh, work in recovery of the space capsules and the NASA program. Um, and uh, the Cold War, an anti-submarine car carrier. Mm -hmm. And then um, after 9-11, it became the headquarters for the FBI in investigating the terror association. So it has a long and storied history. It has a history. lot of it history. Was, it, had, it was the most frequently hit aircraft carrier during World War wow. II. And, and not so limped <laughs> its, back, its way back to port so many times. but. Uh, it, it survived. It's one of its nicknames is the Fighting Eye. Uh, I happened to be on the top of 30 Rock at the observation deck when they were pulling it off the mud to take it to rehab it. Right. And you, um, you so I watched them dock. pull this thing off the mud. <laughs> that was interesting. I've been there several times. It's a very interesting museum. And they changed their exhibits. Uh, oh, yes. they, down, down in the Explorium, which is the uh, part of the carrier um, that shows you how they actually lived on the carrier. You can watch movies from actual footage uh, of, of the car hit. carrier. And you can actually climb into a helicopter, look into one of the old space capsules. And they constantly change the exhibit, so that, that's always... I was there when it was first opened, and that was back in the 1980s, when it first opened as a museum, and you stood on the deck the, where the planes... The flight deck. The mm -hmm. flight deck. And uh, they showed the movie, there was actual footage of when the Japanese hit it and uh, almost destroyed it. And that was very compelling. It is. Very it compelling. Is. So, okay. 
wonderful books. I see you have a coloring book as well. Right. Um, uh, the coloring book, that, that was an interesting, fun project. I, I wanted to give children the opportunity to apply their own creativity mm -hmm. uh, to the series. So what the coloring book is, is a um, series of illustrations. Some of them are portraits. Some of them are, at, are the whole actual illustration from a book in the series. And uh, it's done in, kind, it, it looks almost like grayscale. I don't know if I can hold it up. If you hold it up flat against you, you okay. the camera uh, can pick it up. To get an idea uh, of <clears throat> what it looks like. Okay. Okay, Abe and Mary Lincoln. Um, so the, the lines allow uh, a much more in-depth picture. Mm -hmm. So when a child colors it, 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 it's very sharp and very much in focus. So it comes out almost like a portrait type professional picture. Yeah, that's really nice. And next to each, um, there is a, a famous quote from history. And in the, in the quote, uh, it, has, it has the connection to the picture. So, um, This one is a picture uh, from the uh, Mount Rushmore book. And the land from Mount Rushmore was taken from the Lakota Sioux. Uh, they, they had made a treaty with the, Laco La the Lakota Sioux in 1868. And then by 1876, they were taking the land back from them. So uh, this is Geronimo. And the quote says, I was born on the prairies where the wind blew free, and there was nothing to break the light of the sun. I was born where there were no enclosures. And in the book, Mount Rushmore, uh, we also discuss the Crazy Horse Memorial, which is an attempt by the Native Americans today to build their own monument near, nearby uh, Mount Rushmore. So the book is, it has a lot of uh, pictures, quotes, and I like the one by FDR also. Um, of course, I won't find it now. Now, when you um, decide to visit a place, do you have a plan? Uh, you know, an actual, like, what do you do first? Uh, how do you collect your research? Um, um, I usually decide I want to write about something first and, and then go there. Uh, the books, most of the illustrations um, are a combination of mixed media. So some of them are actual photographs. Um, others are drawings um, and they're kind, kind of superimposed with each other. Uh, usually there's some kind of background that has a theme like in the Mount Vernon book on uh, some of the pages there's a background of the of the actual architect's plan. James Vaughan made the plan for Mount Vernon in, uh, around 1787 for Washington shortly before he moved there uh, to retire. And it has, you know, a backdrop of, of, the, uh, of the actual plan. So the, the backgrounds are, are often related to that. Uh, and the other thing that's, the other book that's a little bit different, in addition to the seven books that are out now, um, I also have one book that is a compilation of three of them. The Adventures of Little Miss History is a really a combination for the New York City adventure. So it has the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, and Intrepid in one book. And a lot of teachers and homeschooling parents had asked, gee, it would be great to have all of the New York City adventures in one book. Uh, in New York State, they mm -hmm. teach local history in fourth grade, and a lot of the teachers wanted to have three of them together. Sure. So that book has actually has three books in one. Oh, but that's nice, nice for schools. That's a good marketing technique. Yeah, and it's, yeah, it's a bargain. It's it's more it, it's more uh, it's cheaper to buy it in one book rather than buy the oh, three sure. single. So single you books. do most of your research on site. Uh, 
No. Uh, I do most of the research. Uh, I decide on the topic. I do the research first. I do a rough draft. And usually I put the rough draft aside. I, I write it usually in one setting, the mm -hmm. first rough draft. Mm -hmm. uh, I put it to, uh, to one side. And often I'll go visit the site after I've done one or two drafts. Mm -hmm. And um, after I've visited the site, then I have a better idea of, of e exactly how I want to present the Yes, book. because your formatting is, is pretty complicated. The formatting of the it actual is, book. It is. Because um, you use, as you said, multimedia. You use photographs, you use uh, um, blueprints, you use um, Victor's illustrations, and you have to decide. That's that's a well, yeah. That's the after <laughs> I've edited the manuscript, and it's usually about ten to ten, twelve times that I've actually gone through the mm -hmm. manuscript. The other thing that's difficult in writing for children is getting it down to a manageable size. And because my books are picture books, they're they generally are under seven hundred fifty words. Yes. Yeah. There's a formula. That the publisher right right <laughs> so it's you five hundred to seven hundred fifty yeah. mm -hmm. words now I want to say a lot and that's probably the most difficult process because not everything is going to get in there mm -hmm. uh, but I also want to entice the children to learn more I re really want them if possible to get out with parents or teachers and go visit the sure site. of course now that isn't always possible but. Um, mm -hmm. I want to give them things that they can investigate and go off in different directions with. So I can't tell them everything. No. And I just try to give them tidbits. And again, I try to include things that are not told in a standard history on the subject. So um, that they'll have other avenues to go off um, with. So that's the way we do that part of it. And then once. <coughs> Once uh, we sit down to actually putting the book in production, Victor takes the uh, his he takes the manuscript and he creates thumbnail sketches first, very rough thumbnails, um, the way he thinks it should be laid out. Now sometimes his vision of how the book has to flow pictorially doesn't quite mesh with my script, and I may have to again. Edit, <laughs> edit it to mm -hmm. just reconfigure a little bit the way I, you know, the way I want to tell it. So yeah, it's usually four to six months. Oh sure. On I you know see that. on going back and forth. So then, when we get the final illustrations, they get drawn, they get colored, uh, sometimes with uh, markers, line pencil, you know, various techniques, and the photographs get inputted, the mm -hmm. whole collage gets put together. And then there's another final edit. Uh, he does the graphics as well and he, because he has a publishing company, so he also does the physical yeah. layout and <coughs> up, right. you know, and the graphics. Who is your publishing company? Eugenist Studios. Okay. So fortunately or unfortunately, you didn't publish it yourself, so you have to adhere to the publishing set. But that's good that you have a traditional publisher. Uh, what is the best way you have for marketing these books? I, so many ways. <laughs> marketing is the hardest do the, part. Do the uh, actual sites, the place you visit, do they carry the books? Some, some of them do. Um, they're um, at the Statue of Liberty. They've been at the Statue of Liberty almost since the book came out for like so three or four years now. Mm -hmm. uh, the Ellis Island book is on Ellis Island. Um, some of the other sites are managed by, I, I don't know how you would call them. Kind a of managing like, company. A managing company <laughs> that, uh, like there are a few companies that manage for museums and aquariums and th they do all of the buying and marketing for them. Um, I'm working on getting the books into some. I'm working right now trying to get the newest book, the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum, into into the museum. I've already talked. With yeah, them. That, that's. You probably eventually will. I mean, I I see I see various authors' books in different places, museums, and um, sometimes very unusual places. And then the um, 
Your books, fortunately, are not fiction because um, the national parks won't take fiction. That's, I had that yeah. problem because I, I tried to get my books into the Fire Island Lighthouse gift shop, and they said, no, it's fiction. We don't. Do I've fiction. noticed that when I, when I go to a national park site, I always... And you go to schools as well, yes? I go to schools. Uh, I do book festivals. Sometimes I do museums. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sequoia National Park uh, book has, has a has science focus as well on the environment. And I've, um, I've gone to a couple of museums with that one, like the Museum of Science in Schenectady. So sometimes museums and historical sites. I've um, done readings at FDR's house in his, and Presidential Library uh, in Hyde Park. Hyde Park, yes. So I've done readings there as well. Have you tried Sagamore Hill here on Long Island? Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's home? No, I haven't yeah. been there. Uh, <laughs> I've, I mean, I've been there years ago. Uh, That's an interesting I'm, place, too. Yes, it is. So what do you get out of this? Uh, I just love to. I love connecting with the kids. I love getting back into the schools and visiting them. Uh -huh. I love connecting with other authors. Uh, because a lot of what I do in, um, puts me into contact with other authors. Is this um, at like conventions? And well, yeah. Um, sometimes podcasts, sometimes book signings, sometimes just over the internet.